we are going to chat about the some of the more important things uh, in terms of personal finance and uh, home financial economics kind of stuff. Uh, and this is, I don't have a script or anything today. I'm just going to kind of ramble and share some of the things that I have learned over the last, oh, I would say I've been financially cognizant and responsible for uh, about 35 years, a little bit more than that. And uh, I've read a lot of books and I've studied a lot and, uh, you know, taken college classes and owned a number of businesses and done some investing and uh, attended conventions. And I, I've really cared about this stuff and put a bunch of knowledge into my head and, and I'm hoping to share that. Uh, in a informal, rambling kind of way, and, and hopefully some of it will be helpful. Uh, my goal is for this uh, podcast to be equivalent to, I don't know, two, maybe three semesters worth of college classes uh, in this topic. So first big thing is the power of saving money, of being disciplined and saving money. Uh, you definitely, you got to get a hold of that. And, and the biggest part of that isn't so much the income, but it is controlling your expenditures to a, uh, a reasonable level. And this can get, this can get uh, confusing, touchy, difficult. Um, it's a very subjective thing based on your values. So I'll give a kind of a scenario of what a typical person does and, and then what I think a person should do. A typical person who is, I don't know, they're maybe early 20s and they are they have their bachelor's degree and whatever, whatever useless thing the university and the government persuaded them to get a bachelor's degree in. But now they have this piece of paper and yeah, they're probably in the top 1% in class or top 50% or whatever. No employer ever cares about that stuff. but. They either got A's or D's or whatever. No employer cares about that stuff either, or very few do. Uh, so now this new person is going out and they're starting their world for real, uh, their real life. And they get a job making good money. Uh, well, I guess what I think is good money because I grew up so poor, but I don't know. They're making 50 or 75,000 bucks a year and they're doing... Uh, I don't know what it is they're doing, but they're doing it. And, and out of this money, let's say that they're uh, making 75 grand a year. Well, the government is going to take roughly a third of that. And they're not going to really pay attention to that. They think they're making 75,000 a year when in fact they're making 50,000 a year post government theft. So what they should be doing their calculations based on is $50,000. Well, your housing should not be more than 25% of uh, your monthly or annual or whatever expenditures. So that comes out to being uh, roughly $1,000 a month is the most they should spend on housing. Well, they're not going to do that, probably. They're probably going to want a nicer place than that. They're probably going to spend 2000 a month, which comes out to 24 thousand dollars a year and then by the time we add electricity and cable and uh, internet and, and all this other stuff by the time we've added all of that in they've got a huge portion of their money going out just for living uh, basic living expenses and and, and the creature comforts uh, you know having the electricity run is gonna uh, the the air conditioner if they're in a hot place or the heater if they're in a cold place uh, and it's going to be a lot of money. That's going to take them up to, I don't know, twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight thousand dollars a year is going to go just toward housing. And then they're going to need their car because maybe the one that their parents gave to them to use in college has now worn out, or it just no longer fits their image. They have a fancy new job. They're a college graduate. Of course, they deserve a, a nicer, newer vehicle. So they're going to go buy a forty thousand dollar vehicle, let's say, and. Uh, they're going to have monthly payments of, I don't know what payments are these days. Um, it's been a long time since I've ever had a, a car payment uh, because they're such a bad idea because of interest rates and such. Uh, but I, I don't know, 40000 for five years. Uh, what is that? Eight grand a year. And then with interest, let's say that's another four grand. So 12 grand a year. So it's $1,000 a month car payment. 
Uh, so that's another 12,000 a year added on top of, uh, where were we before? Uh, let's say 28,000. So now we're up to $40,000 a year and the person only has $10,000 left over after their vehicle and their uh, house expense, and their housing expense. Um, and this is not enough. This is only, uh, you know, less than $1,000 a month for food, for clothing, for fuel for the vehicle, for insurance for the vehicle, uh, for all the extra cell phone bills and, and uh, entertainment and all these other things. And so the person ends up being just about dead broke at the end. Now, this whole, this whole scenario I've just run through, it would be very similar if the person was hired for $100,000 a year uh, or $50,000 a year and then had taxes stolen from them after that, uh, or $200,000 a year. It would be very much the same. So when the person who's making $25,000 a year complains that they don't have enough money and they're dead broke and they don't have enough to put anything into savings. I get it. I mean, they have a, a way better excuse for not having a good savings account than the wealthy person does, uh, than the person who's a higher earner. Uh, yeah, that's a, it's tougher when you make less money, which is why you should make yourself worth more money. Uh, we'll get into that at another time, but what should this person do? Going back to this original scenario, what is it then that I'm advising this person who's making uh, 75000 a year taking home, uh, and when I say taking home, I mean after federal income taxes and state income taxes and uh, that kind of stuff, um, they're taking home 50000 a year. Well, I think that the first thing they should do is pay themselves, and that is the first thing that comes off of your budget every single uh, paycheck. And it's up to you what percentage you do. If you are aggressive and you do 25%, that's great. You will learn to live on what's left over. Uh, if you do only 10%, that's okay. That's still five grand a year now uh, that you're going to be able to put us put away. Um, that's not bad. Uh, that, that's, that's pretty good uh, because you're making roughly four grand a month after taxes. So after one uh, one year, you already have a, a month of life, a little over a month of life paid for. You could take a month between jobs and not change your lifestyle at all. Like that would be a neat safety net, huh? Uh, what if you were doing 20%? What, and then you'd put it to side 10,000 in the first year. Now that, we're, we're talking the, re the real deal there. Um, and then listen, you do that for a couple of years. That kind of adds up, doesn't it? So whatever you're doing, put that money into some savings. Now there's a good argument from a book I recently read that says when you first start out in your career, you're not going to be making as much as you will five years later. So what, you know, $10,000 the first year seems like a huge amount. You're like, wow, if I had a $10,000 sitting in a bank, um, I would be rich. That's awesome. Well, hopefully within five years, you're making so much that uh, $10,000 is no big deal. And so this author's argument was spend it now, but don't skimp and save because it's, you'll make up way more than that later when you're earning more. Well, I don't know. It's something to think about, but I'm, I'm a saver. Well, how do you go about saving this if you don't have enough money to save it? Well, it comes down to living more like the normal human being lives. And I'm speaking in English to people who live in the United States primarily right now, um, or other developed nations who are just spoiled since the, I don't know, the 1930s, 40s, 50s, whenever. I mean, we've had close to a hundred years of just luxury. Um, that may be more 75 years. The, our living memory, most of us under 50, well, those of us under 50 in, in developed countries, we don't know what poverty is. We don't know what the real world is. We think that it's just normal to take a hot shower for as long as we want in the morning. We think it's normal to get to sleep in a room by ourselves unless we are we have a lover. We think that that's just normal. Well, yeah, there's mom and dad and two kids, and so of course you need three bedrooms, plus an extra one is a guest room or a, an office. We just think that kind of stuff is normal. We think having a car that we know is going to run and run well 
is normal. And, and, and we think that having things like electric windows and all the fancy gadgets on the car, we think that's normal. Well, it ain't. It just, throughout human civilization, it is not normal. And today, in the, in the last 10 years, it is not normal. Now, it's normal in the United States uh, because we're still living from the residual time when there was more of a free market environment uh, in, in the United States. And, and much of that has kind of that momentum is carrying forward, even though it's rapidly diminishing. That momentum has carried us into the, just this time of plenty and we are spoiled. So what I'm encouraging you to do is think about the person in India or China or Africa or uh, look at the places where there's, you know, half of the world's population is pretty poor. How do they live? And yeah, you might have to suck it up. There's a good chance you won't be able to live in a nice, clean, wonderful, quiet apartment all by yourself. Uh, a two-bedroom apartment or even a one-bedroom apartment or even a studio apartment for the first three or five years of your professional life. Don't just think that the world owes that to you or that you ought to go get that right away. I would say live rough and tough. Um, find, you know, depending on your lifestyle, go find a little old lady or a little old retired man and rent a room from them in the quiet neighborhood that's boring. Make sure you're respectful toward them and, and and don't, you know, roar your engine in their driveway and all this kind of stuff. Like, make sure you're a good tenant. Uh, but this is the ideal situation. Now you're down to a thousand bucks a month for a room, or in many places in the country, you could get it for less than that, especially if you offer to do some stuff around the property, like changing light bulbs, mowing the lawn, et cetera, et cetera. If you can show yourself to have value to these folks, you can get a much better deal. And that, if you could get that down to 750 bucks a month for a room, oh my gosh, you'd be able to save some money. Uh, and especially since they're paying for the electricity and you negotiate that into the deal and then you just have one bill you're paying, which is your rent. Um, that's the way to go. Or if you're willing to really rough it, you know, you've got your gym membership, buy an old van and put a, a mattress in there and sleep in there and go shower at the at the gym every morning and yeah that's not awesome that's not your ideal but what if you did that for a year you bought a twelve thousand dollar old van and you pay it off in one year by paying your rent payments of a thousand bucks a month you pay it off in a year and you've got a twelve thousand dollar van that you own free and clear that is also your house you could sell it if you needed to you can continue to use it. Uh, maybe you'd be comfortable with that van life. Uh, you're not going to want a van when you're 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, probably. You're going to want more luxury. But suck it up while you're young. Suck it up and live rough. So if you could do that in the van, after one year, you've got 10000 extra savings just from, uh, from rent from not paying a regular rent of $2,000 a month as the, the scenario for the first person, you've got a huge savings there. So you've got a, a free, I'm gonna call it, you have a paid off van and 10,000 in the bank, 12,000 in the bank at the end of a year. Oh my gosh, now your net worth is 12,000 plus, uh, we'll say a thousand a month for the rent, so that's 12,000. So you have a $24,000 net worth at the end of the year. What does the other person have? The person who went and got the nice apartment for 2000 a month, well, that person at the end of the year, they have zero in savings and they have nothing. Their net worth continues to be zero or maybe a couple thousand that their car, uh, maybe it's, it's they paid it down a little bit, but they probably got in such a fancy car that by the time they drove it off the lot, uh, it's worth way less. So yeah, they've got zero at the end of that year. Okay, so if you're doing it this smart way, you don't get the fancy new car, you get the older van with low mileage that's 15, 20 years old, but it's a solid vehicle. And okay, so you've got that at the end of the year and you've got $12,000 saved up. You haven't purchased the newest, best iPhone or Android 17, whatever, that's 1500 bucks. No, go get a basic, simple three, four, five hundred dollar phone, depending on what your professional needs are. And, you know, buy it. Don't get a payment plan. Buy it free and clear. Uh, sign up for the monthly 
thing or the annual thing with, with your carrier. Uh, don't fall for those scams of bringing in the new phone every two years and it's just always going to be only $60 a month and you have a new phone every two years. Don't go for that. Buy it, keep it for two or three years, um, and then sell it and get a new one. Okay, so that's just a, a real quick rundown of what I think you could do differently than what the other person does, the, the less financially savvy, less disciplined person. Um, and, and now you're already ahead. You're already building that net worth. Let's, let's talk now about the rule of 72. And the rule of 72 is that any number divided into 72, uh, or yeah, any number into 72, that number times the other number that would equal 72, that is the amount that your money will grow if you are uh, investing it somehow. So I explained that poorly, but let's say that you uh, are making 7.2% interest in 10 years, 10 times 7.2 is uh, 72. That's a rule of 72. So in 10 years, at 7.2% interest, you will have doubled the amount of money you have. That's pretty cool, huh? And so your goal in life, and it goes the other way too. Let's say you had, uh, what's something that's divisible by 72? I'm not even thinking straight now. Uh, is it nine by eight? I think that might be. Um, gosh, it's been so long since I've done my multiplication tables, but let's say it is. So 9% interest in eight years, your money will double. Uh, let's take half of 72, uh, which would be what, 36? If you're getting 36% interest, your money will double in two years. If you're getting 2% interest, your money will double in 36 years. So you need to get a high return rate on the money you have. Well, what is, and I'm saying this to you because you now have a net worth of $24,000. So how do you now start leveraging that money? You've only been in the professional world for a year and you're already up to that net worth how do you start leveraging that? Well, the money that you have, quote unquote, in the bank, you need to keep some of that as your safety net. It has to be liquid, or in other words, easily accessible. So maybe you say it takes you, you know, four grand to live for a month, and then hopefully you've lowered your living style uh, uh, enough that it's not that much. So maybe that gets you a month and a half or two months, but let's say even one month still. So 4,000 of it, you're not gonna touch, but you have 6,000. And you want that 6000 to double as soon as possible. So how can you invest that money so that it doubles? You can do something high risk and potentially get a higher return or potentially lose all your money. You can go with something low risk and you're probably not going to get much of a return. So while you're young, it's generally a better idea to have more risky investments that have a, have a greater return. Um, when that 6000 that you have available to invest, when that turns into 12000 it'll probably be long enough that, yeah, kind of like that author said, that won't be as big of a deal to you. Um, so it's going to have to be a pretty good percentage rate in order for it to turn over soon enough to be valuable for you. So I, my suggestion is that for your first years, maybe first three or five or 10 years of professional life, bust it, work really hard. So maybe there's no better investment than investing in yourself and some tools for your side hustle. So if your main job is something that is a new age, uh, modern type job, which chances are that it is, uh, that you know, you're a, I don't know, you're a, a search engine optimization consultant or you run you know social media for some company or you're doing something in the tech industry or you're working at a hospital or whatever be thinking also about real rough tough jobs that always exist blue collar jobs um, being a, a stonemason or a windshield uh, chip repair person a glass uh, residential or commercial glass cleaner person, a plumber, electrician, 
all the little side things. What about the person who goes around and uh, installs new sliding uh, patio doors? So you don't have to know anything about construction except everything surrounding that. Uh, or what about doing oil changes, mobile oil changes for cars? Or as there are more and more electric cars out there, what kind of maintenance needs to be done on them? Uh, can you invent a new area of work to be done on electric cars? Or what about uh, there are now a lot of solar panels on on buildings and at residences? What kind of maintenance do those need? Could you come up with some special cleaner uh, and you invent it and it's just slightly better than any of the other ones and you come and clean solar panels and you convince people it needs to be done every 30 or 90 days so that they're absorbing the most sunlight and it's a turnkey thing that you just do it and you start this little side hustle. The great thing about that is you can do it any time of the day. You can do it any time of the week. Uh, you could set aside two days and you decide to take a day off and I just roll those clients over to the next weekend. Um, but get a side hustle and you, so you're going to need ladders. You're going to need, uh, I don't know, squeegees for these solar panel, the stuff you're doing. You might even need to rent a storage unit uh, to store your cleaning uh, solutions and ladders and all that kind of stuff. Uh, as you're buying these things, think about the long-term investment that you're buying and then also see if you can get them at a discount. So if you need a $300 ladder, for example, <clears throat> don't go buy a brand new one. Search in the online ads, Craigslist, I guess, the big cities have or whatever you have, Facebook Marketplace, search for a while and find a good deal. I actually just recently bought a over $300 ladder for a hundred bucks uh, from somebody on Facebook. And that is now an asset. I have an asset that is really, truly, if you can get a good deal, you know, hundred dollars for that ladder, it was probably worth $200 used. I just got a good deal. Guy was desperate and about to leave town and listed it too late and I got it. So if you can find that kind of a deal, now you have a $200 asset. So now your net worth hasn't changed. You've just changed from having that $200 in your account to having a $200 ladder. That's if you paid the full 200 value. If you only paid a hundred like I did, well now you've added a hundred dollars to your net worth and you have a tool that you can use to make more money. Now that is investing. And then go out and use your elbow grease to, to make these connections and uh, and actually do your squeegee cleaning of the solar panels or whatever specialty niche thing you found. Uh, by the way, uh, it'd be a good idea to read the book, Blue Ocean Strategies. Uh, and it, I think there are two editions. The first one is much better than the second. You'll have to forgive the authors. They are really into the whole the higher learning college university speak kind of thing. Uh, they, they love using big complicated words uh, that don't make as much sense and don't communicate as well as smaller, simpler words. But the point they get across is brilliant. So definitely a must read book. Um, so now a year or two into this business, it is now making money. You've invested into it. You've invested into marketing. You happen to have purchased a van. So you have a perfect uh, kind of vehicle to carry your ladder on top uh, for your sque squeegee cleaning of the solar panels. And of course, I'm just you know, making up a, a job, but be an entrepreneur of some sort in something that is a real cold, hard, factual, actual job. Um, not some BS fancy living in good times kind of job. Um, there are so many of those that, that aren't going to be worth much in the long run. So make sure you have that good, solid, stable trade kind of job. Uh, you'll you'll be glad you have that skill set at some point in your future. And I hope we live another 75 years without having all the nastiness come to be that they talk about in the fourth turning and that Ray uh, Dalio is talking about. And, and um, uh, there, there there's Tom Bilyeu and, of course, the Austrian School of Economics has been talking about this for a long time. Like, there's there are probably going to be some really bad times coming. And... Get prepared for them. Get the tools so that if you lose your main job and you can no longer go get a fifty or seventy-five thousand dollar a year job, that you have a backup plan. You can still go out and get enough to live in this van that you've paid off and eat a can of tuna every day. Like that's that's being solvent. That's being 
prepared for the future. Um, not living beyond your means. So I hope this this little spiel about saving money and living frugally, huh, isn't it incredible? <laughs> little s- s- side note here. Isn't it incredible that I invented this brilliant idea? I'm joking, of course. I mean, this this is what your grandparents told you. This is what is t- discussed in the, the old, the, the Bible. This is discussed by Stoics. This is discussed by many people for many thousands of years. Uh, this is how to do things. This is how su- uh, successful people live. It, it, not the outliers. I'm not saying the 1% of people who are rich because they inherited daddy's money. But this is how people who build success in their life, most of them, way over 80%, have done these things like just you count on 80 to 100 hour weeks for the first 10 years of your career. And, and you know that there's a good chance you're going to have some big failures and you're going to have to do that for the next 10 year span too. So yeah, maybe the first 20 years of your career, you spend an average of 80 hours a week working. That's fine. That's normal for successful people. It's not successful for, uh, or it's not normal for unsuccessful, woke, new agey kind of people. Um, the, the, for many years, governments have tried to convince people that they need a, a good work-life balance and 40 hours a week is right because then you can go to the local government recreation center and play volleyball with your neighbors on Saturday afternoons in a league. And, and it, There's a, a certain life that has been projected that we should live, and I'm suggesting that there's a, a different way, depending on your value system. If it's like mine, then it's a better way. Uh, up to you, but that's the kind of a part one of how to get your financial life squared away and what to do. And I've kind of been speaking to you as though you're a a 20 year old just getting started. So I think we're going to do another part now. Uh, Let's talk in the next section. Uh, One of the things we'll talk about are, well, what if you haven't done what I said and, and you're a little bit older and you're kind of starting over? How do you how do you build your life then? We not, might talk also about some character traits and some of the things you can do to, to be excellent.